last March, uh, just before the Australian border closure, I had to rush back from Gothenburg, Sweden, to return here, home to Brisbane. Um, so the the transfer to a predominantly online social life has been pounded into my mind since then. I feel I need to think about it, especially because as an artist, I've been working a lot with different publics and public spaces, um, and also with my upcoming project, Protocols of Killings, where I want to work with publics and public spaces internationally. By publics here, I mean groups of people that gather and organize, uh, but now that the pandemic has um, changed the way we gather, um, it makes me really wonder. Um, this changes um, to the ways we organize, congregate, or assemble, um, and this changes to the ways a public is formed. What do these mean to my practice? Uh, when working with these publics and public spaces, I often draw from the methods of critical play, where I would incite members of the publics to take part in a group activity, like a workshop or a game. Um, so what I'll do today is, in principle, thinking through this big question of how to work with the transferred and transformed publics by firstly looking at my previous works and um, identifying what it is that I have done. Um, obviously, if the publics have been transferred to online environment, our first intuition would be to well, simply follow these publics online. But how exactly and what are the signposts that I need to pay attention to? So I'll try to go through these questions by way of my previous works that took form in games and workshops. Um, I call them game performances and workshop performances because the participants are um, social actors. Well, yeah, and, um, and as social actors, they would draw from their own backgrounds, which is a kind of a social cultural repertoire, to, so to say, um, that they are familiar with and um, uh, that they draw from um, to deal with the circumstances that are set by the rules of the games or workshops. I'll talk a little bit about the Butterfly Generator, Nuna um, Noton Palafla series, Terra um, Incognita, etc., and also about Make Your Own Passport. But I will mainly just go through these works only to emphasize some of their practical aspects that I will then revisit when I introduce my upcoming project, Protocols of Killings, right at the end. Um, and after all this, I'll come in. Uh, we'll actually play some simple games together, which we will also discuss afterwards. Okay, I've mentioned earlier um, how I think some publics and public spaces are now sort of transferred online. Imagine a certain public say, um, in this case, us, a public that's gathering in front of a stage or a big screen in a public space together. Well, right now, in this um, stage or this big screen has been dispersed onto smaller screens. Your computer monitor or for some of you, maybe your mobile screen and instead of being in a public space, you're in your own private space. And so depending on whether you use virtual background or not, like me, a piece of your private space also becomes sort of public. And as a public that gathers online, you and I, the members of this public, are also dispersed physically, together with um, our own physical materials and physical spaces that we have access to. Um, I can touch my pen, for example, but you can't. Um, but of course, there are ways like the Internet of Things for you to control some of my physical environment if we prepare it to be so, like in this work. This is the butterfly generator, and like many of my game performances, it depends on physical materials and physical spaces. Uh, many of my games works are not online games per se. 
even when some parts of the work would be online. So in this work, the image you see projected on that, that screen is actually the twin of the machine you see in front of the screen where the, the person is sitting at. Um, you see the container of the twin machine from above, uh, practically almost like your own view of your machine when you sit in front of it. Um, um, this image shows the installation in its first exhibition in 2011 um, that was called the Global Contemporary Art World after 1989 in ZKM in Karlsruhe, Germany. Uh, but this machine you see in front of the screen was in Osage Art Foundation in Hong Kong. Uh, they're the host of the last half of my ZKM residency. So from Hong Kong, you see the twin machine in Germany projected on your screen. Right? Both machines are connected through the Internet of Things in such a way that each player is actually controlling both machines in the two places through online means. So when you press a button on your machine in Hong Kong, it activates a set of fan that blows the container. Now, um, you can imagine that while the action of the fan blowing is exactly the same on both machines, we can't simply predict the way the populace are blown. In other words, um, I can say that we know the rules of the game but still can't predict the outcomes, at least not simply. Now, I've just mentioned rules there. Um, rules is something that is very specific to games. Um, humans have been playing games since almost 85 centuries ago. That's 8,500 8, years ago. Um, and for the last whole century, um, a lot of scholarships and researches on games haven't been able to agree on a clear definition on uh, a clear definition of a game, actually. Uh, but if they do agree on a few things, the existence of rules is one of them. Rules are a limiting context, a structure of a game. This is a quote from the book Critical Play by Mary Flanagan an artist, game designer, uh, and theorist who says that games have varying roles, including to understand uncertainty. Um, critical play for Flanagan is a is, is game environment that represent questions about aspects of human life. What's very interesting as well is what Flanagan says about rules. When we talk about rules, right, do you remember that saying um, that rules are made to be broken. Well, that saying has been used in many contexts by different people, uh, and Flanagan believes that players will explore and push the boundaries between rules and their own agency. Um, they will continuously, consistently do that. Um, and that this uh, subversion that's inherent in in gameplay can take form in um, cheating, open play, or social critique. So if you do sometimes feel like cheating in playing a game, uh, just know that your feeling is shared by many players for almost 8,500 years. Well, which uh, brings me to the next work that I'll talk about, a series that I call Nuna Noton Paro Fleur. This series is also a hybrid game. It depends on physical material and physical space as well as digital infrastructure. But unlike in the butterfly generator where the digital in infrastructure is crucial for simultaneous connection between two physical spaces and materials, in Nuna Noton Palo Fleur, the digital infrastructure connects between different timelines. So as part of the installation, there are always a certain, a certain kind of map, a set of monitors, and a set of surveillance cameras. The map would constantly change according to the rules that I, uh, the rules of the game that I give the players. Uh, and when the players, the visitors, interact with the map, these changes are continuously recorded by the surveillance cameras, uh, and then fed as data that are processed by the digital infrastructure and then streamed out to the monitors. 
So some of the monitors would be live stream, um, showing the map from above as it is. Um, so uh, players can use this moving image to navigate themselves on, on the whole map. Um, and also, usually there are facilitators of the game that will communicate these rules to the visitors. And as we can imagine, um, while conveying the rules, they'll also have conversations about the work. In this reiteration of the work in Leiden, there are four surveillance cameras capturing the site from different angles. Uh, and four of the monitors are simply straightforward live streams from these cameras, uh, while at the same time the digital system would process this live stream into time lapse and show them to the visitors um, through the other four monitors. And these four, mon four other monitors showed what had happened since the beginning of the installation until the present time, so the time lapse, lapse of the history of the site. Um, so this is how this is um, uh, why I said earlier that the monitors would connect the players to the contextual timelines of the physical material that they they can touch in front of them. Um, to give you an idea, um, a further idea of what I mean by connection between different timelines, I'll show you a clip from another installation where the recorded videos were edited into an installation. This was in Jakarta, um, although the eight monitors were afterwards shown separately from the physical map. So each one of them shows a specific timeline iteration of the evolution of the map. Uh, some shows only the time lapse of the map, taking players out of the map as though you know the map evolves by itself without you know, without the role of the players. Um, but some are um, only featuring the players in a slow motion time. Uh, and of course, because this is a, a game performance which comes with its own set of rules, players have agency and boy, they, do they use them. Um, this is a timeline capture at the reiteration of the work in Utrecht, the Netherlands, where we can see how the players made bridges here between Europe and the Americas. So in a way, we can think of the players as having, having agency. But at the same time, when they have the rights to agency, of course, they also have the responsibility to agency, right? And also being subversive in this kind of game, which although it's representative of aspects of human lives, is also not immediately causing something. Um, uh, practically, it just means that the players are being more playful and creative. Well, while talking about rules and subversion, I'd also like to bring in other examples from another work, Terra Incognita, etc. This is also a game performance where the digital infrastructure is very minimal. In this case, only as an assisting grid projection, actually, that can be adjusted from time to time. But I'd like to focus on the rule bending and participatory quality of the work. Um, and yes, of course, uh, when we talk about games, um, other than the rules, a uh, game is also often participatory. That's also one of the characteristics of games. Although, of course, there are solitary games like Sudoku, or solitaire, but the whole reason I use games in my work is to engage participants. Um, so Terra Incognita is quite interesting because the rules are very limiting. The bottom line is, as a participant, you're invited to claim an area on the world map. Um, you know, there's no question whether, you know, like, no choice whether you can or not. Um, so this is the world map, by the way, a dimension projection by Buckminster Fuller, in which um, he peels off the world from the center out. So Africa is up there, Australia is at the bottom left, and Antarctica on the, the, the other end. Um, when players come into a game, they'll have to take a lucky draw. Um, well, they take the flags first, and then they take the lucky draw, which give, gives them difficult. random toy money yeah, that decides um, how many grids on the map they can the map. claim. 
Um, sometimes I would create inflation and deflation by adjusting the size of the grid. Uh, and it's quite interesting how some people refuse to play and say, I'm the not interested in that ownership. It is as though the map is so powerful that if you can, if you do claim on the map, it'll actually manifest in real life. <laughs> and it is interesting, though, to ask, however, is um, uh, 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 to ask whether when you're and not when you're not engaging in the game, how would you be able to break the rules, right? Some people who decided to p play the game did try to break the rules. Instead of writing their names, for example, they write a message. This uh, person, Frances, I don't know how to, how to pronounce it, but also I don't know whether it's their real name because I have no way to check it. Um, they also wrote um, Land of Free Palestine. Um, and then later, I found out that in the toilet of the gallery, the same person wrote "Free Free Palestine" as well. Same font, same same style. <laughs> uh, some other people, instead of breaking the rule, tried to negotiate different alternatives to engage. This is an iteration of Terra Incognita at the Slave School, where I added toy soldiers into the game. Way, um, uh, uh, well, uh, I added toy soldiers into the game. This person chose the toy soldier um, and made an imaginary imaginary army to resist or, or rather persuade against territorial claims. But I think this is the dilemma of games, you know. If you refuse to play, you wouldn't have the opportunity to negotiate a change. So this could make you think that you should play the game so that, like this person, you can negotiate to bend the rules a bit and therefore negotiate some kind of a change. But even when you're trying to work within the system, to negotiate within the system while working against the system, is it really possible to not be complicit? I do wonder, and I don't know the answer. Um, talking about negotiation, we can see how in the words that I've shown you so far, the butterfly generator, terra incognita, etc. There are different degrees of negotiations that we can imagine happening. Um, this negotiation would usually take place in the form of conversations. And conversations are the focus of make your own passport which is a workshop performance that I've been staging in public spaces since 2014. The workshop starts with a little game of lucky draw as well to determine the participants' new citizenship. Um, after they find a passport kit, they'll sit together with other participants and that's when the conversations take place. Some uh, players' subversion do happen but the conversations that result are usually about the bigger picture of citizenship and statelessness, of migration and of people seeking asylum, of human rights and of ethics. Which brings me to my upcoming project where I'm planning to engage different publics and public spaces as well. Uh, I'll let you know a bit about the premise of the project and then I'll finish with some specific notes. Uh, Protocols of Killings, 1965, Distance, and the Ethics of Future Warfare uh, is along the line of my previous work, um, 1001 Martian Nights. If you need a refresher, the link is above on the screen. In this project, I'll be looking at the ethics of future warfare um, through performative aesthetic translations of a recently declassified U.S. archive on distant killings. Um, the starting point of the project is the latest technologies of distant killings, um, drone warfare, which has caused public anxieties, especially because of their secrecy. Um, the Intercept that online publication that initially published um, Edward Snowden's um, documents. Um, they published a leaked document in 2015 consisting of 73 slides of a Pentagon study 
that shows a linear kill command chain where each target of the drone um, is approved by the President of the United States. But um, autonomous swarm drones is something else. The kill chain in autonomous swarm drones is unlikely linear. Uh, and that's the current development of the technology. Last year, for example, the UK government invested 2.5 million pounds sterling to develop this technology. Um, now, the limited data on drone warfare adds to the challenge of assessing uh, the ethical issues of this kind of future warfare. Uh, and of course, this drone warfare seems very unprecedented, right? However, if we emphasize on the form of distant killings as a kind of covert outsourced killings, a workable historical case with significantly more data may help this ethical assessment. So um, this historical case of covert distant killings that I will observe is the Indonesian mass killings 1965-66. As you may know, um, the Indonesian mass killings were shrouded in secrecy for decades and are still um, unacknowledged by the Indonesian government until now. In 1990, journalist Kathy Kadain wrote in Washington Post that during the critical period of 1965 to 1966, the American press possessed information concerning the U.S. roles and activities in Indonesia, but chose not to share the information with the American people. Political scientist Jay Chun Kim argues that the world's leading democracies back then collaborate to secretly help in the consolidation of military dictatorship in Indonesia. In 2018, the U.S. National Security Archive declassified a large archive connected to the killings. It's a 30,000-page record of daily inter-embassies communication from the Jakarta U.S. Embassy between 1964 and 1968 that surrounds the killings. This uh, project will be the first that analyzes the archive as a whole to find patterns in decentralized power dynamics between the embassies that may mimic the protocols of autonomous swarm drones, which operate as a pack without a central control. Um, the idea is that patterns emerging from analysis of the archive will be translated into multimodal workshops and games and performances. In these workshops and performances, survivors, um, including myself, will work together with the public to pro protocols of autonomous, uh, autonomous swarm drones that operate as a pack without a central control. In the workshops, um, distance will be discussed also in relation to accountability and complicity. And so it is quite interesting, actually, that um, we're entering this um, era where um, we're supposed to be working from a distance, actually. Well, uh, we've talked about games and they might sound all fun, but somehow I've come into a quite heavy note here with the Protocols of Killings project. Um, I would like to note, though, that Protocols is some kind of a game as well but uh, where the rules are not written or even not publicized or even not agreed actually <laughs> you know like maybe different players have different uh, rules um, alexander galloway in his book protocols how control exists after decentralization reminds us that um, protocol is a solution to the problem of hierarchy he says um, so it's how a seemingly out-of-control technology can function so flawlessly. In these circumstances, talking about games and the bending of rules, I hope can shed light on the game-like characteristics of everyday life.